Hey everybody, it's Richard Harrison Scott Lease with another edition of the Surf and Sales Podcast brought to you by uh, our sponsors. So Lead 411, obviously they will give you direct dial phone numbers and buyer intent data, which is super important. Find them the new uh, organization that just joined us where they can help you define what makes a great A player and help you find them even when they're not on the job market. So please sure, be sure to check out Find Them. Gong, one of the leaders in the conversational intelligence space, and then Perception Predict, which can actually accurately predict your team's performance. So they've got a massive algorithm that really helps you determine, will this person hit your goal? Or will they not hit their goal? And if so, by how much will they achieve it or miss it by? So anyway, please check those folks out. We appreciate it. With all that out of the way, let's introduce Amy Voles. Amanda Voles. Holy shit, I just messed it up on day one of Monday. Amanda, I am sorry. Uh, who is the VP of sales at the Born Group. So um, I'm not going to mess up the other parts. So I'm not even going to bring it up because I know <laughs> I will. Uh, maybe Scott will drop it in. But Amanda, thank you for coming on the show. And I apologize. I was so focused on getting your last name right. I forgot about the first name. No worries. No worries at all. Yeah. So, okay. We've done, we've done 160 shows and it's the first time we've screwed the name up. Yeah, exactly. So, I forget. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it's like, and the winner of the Oscar is. Um, <laughs> so Amanda, what is the Born Group? Like, what does the VP of Sales do there? Like, what's that even, just give people some context of where you're, you're coming from. Yeah, sure. I, I'm actually new to the Born Group. I started in July. Um, I was at COVID layoff in March and then was on the job hunt. That's a whole other story. But the Born Group is a digital agency and we specialize in e-commerce, um, digital design, uh, we do digital marketing content. We are an SI firm also, so we can do implementation. Yeah, but what's, what's all that mean? What, what pain yeah. do you solve, right? What, say that again? What pain does that solve for people? Oh, pain. So uh, the pain point, I guess, is e-commerce organization. So like if you're a store and you're selling something and you need to sell it better and faster and smarter, um, you need to adopt an e-commerce tool to help you do that for transactions. And we do the implementation and we do the creative for that as well. Got it. So I actually want to dive into something you said. I don't think it's another story. I think it's a really relevant story. You said, you know, you were a COVID layoff in March and it took you till July. I think there's a lot of people who've been experiencing that or, or maybe starting to experience it now. You know, any suggestions like, you know, of, of how you get through that, right? Like it's a long process to find a job right now and it's mm -hmm. be hard to stay motivated even in a regular world, not to mention the COVID world. So, you know, how were you able to manage and cope? Like what, what were some of the things you figured out? Um, you know, it was really hard. It was a shock. I was completely shocked when it happened. Um, and it was very early on in the pandemic. So that first two weeks when everything started shutting down in mid-March, um, I got my notice the end of March and, um, yeah, I mean, I'm shocked. I couldn't believe it. Um, so I knew that it was going to be difficult to find a job during this shutdown time. And there were millions of Americans being laid off. And, you know, I did kind of what I uh, think was pretty risky at the time, but I really thought it was important to be vulnerable and to share what was going on. And so I made a video and posted on LinkedIn. How did that work? How did, uh, what kind of response did you get? I, I got tremendous amount of response. And actually it was because of that video that I ended up getting the job that I have now. So in the video, I basically just say it, I've, I've been laid off, um, but I'm grateful and I'm lucky. My family is safe. We are healthy. Um, I was financially secure enough that it wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't going day to day, not able to feed my family like so many millions of Americans are today. And so um, I was just really vulnerable. And I just said, if, you know, if you're looking to hire anybody or if there's anything I can do for you from a um, freelance standpoint, let me know. And my video got thousands and thousands of views and I was able to network with lots of people. And um, the current CEO of Born for my current job, he, um, he reached out and uh, it, it was very nice. And I had so many people um, care, uh, send caring messages, offer to get me interviews. And all of the interviews that I did get, most of them were from that video and from my activity on LinkedIn. So I'm a huge proponent of using LinkedIn, uh, but specifically video and working your network. And since then I've done subsequent 
uh, videos about the importance of kind of working your network and really being your true authentic self on LinkedIn instead of this kind of fake professional uh, that sometimes people think that we're supposed to be on LinkedIn. And I probably did too many years ago. And then since then, I've actually helped a couple of my friends um, and LinkedIn connections do their own videos that led them to work when they were also COVID layoffs. So I've, I've found a way to give back. So that was, I mean, well, that was really important to me. I think that's great. That's beautiful. Did you know your current CEO before this video or is he a stranger? No, I didn't know him at all. I was connected to uh, the managing director of the firm, mm -hmm. um, just a LinkedIn connection and a, a personal friend. And um, he, I think, might have liked my video or commented on it, which then popped up into the CEO's feed. So, um, you know, that would be my ask of anybody that you know of that's looking for a job is just to comment and interact on their content. And that way they're going to start popping into other people's feeds. And, and that's what did it for me. So I'm very yeah, I've, been, I've been adding a lot, commenting for my link, I mean, for my network, right? Mm -hmm. Just so that it could expand on that. How did you handle the mental wherewithal of all this, right? You do have a family, you know, much like myself or Scott, we'd be okay, um, uh, which we are all very fortunate and lucky about, but how did you handle the mental struggle that comes with a job search? Because it's not easy emotionally, no matter how financially secure you are, it's still not easy. Yeah, it was definitely a hit to the ego more than anything, I think because I was surprised and because it had never really happened before. And, um, you know, I, I was lucky in a way that my kids were home because of COVID. And so we got to spend a lot of family time together. So I just really l leaned on what was most important in life. And that was the health of my family and friends. Um, and that we were able to spend that time together. And, you know, how is, I, I lived my life on this whole theory of things could be worse, right? So, you know, something bad might happen in life to all of us and bad things happen every day or unfortunate things or even minor life inconveniences happen every day. And, and I try to live from a, a place of gratitude. So um, does it suck? Yeah, it fucking sucked. Yeah, it was awful. Um, but it could have been worse, right? I could have been homeless. I could have not been able to feed my family. I mean, it could have been worse in so many other ways. And I was able to really learn from it and build a stronger personal network um, just from a work standpoint and then stronger myself and being able to find value in the strengths that I do have and to be able to lean on some of those. So, um, you know, it, it was no fun, but, but I made it work. Just were, you, like everybody else's. were you leaning on your um, <clears throat> network and, and kind of the branding of Amanda prior to COVID or is this really like a new development for you? That's a really great question. It's new. It's new. Um, and I started kind of making some of that content on LinkedIn and doing that whole like self branding thing by watching people on LinkedIn who did it and who did it really well. And, you know, I'm not out there selling anything. I think so many of my, um, my connections on LinkedIn are selling something or their own brand or their consulting services, but I wasn't really, I mean, I was just doing it to, uh, to give back and to share my experience and sales and things that work well for me and what don't doesn't work well for me. Um, but, but it was really COVID that kind of made me realize like it's great to have a job, but really ultimately it's, it's about who you are as an individual and your own brand and your own success that you have to drive. Yeah. Um, that was a hard <laughs> lesson. So what has it been like onboarding as a, as a VP? There's been a, a there's been a ton of conversation, I don't think, about um, the challenges of onboarding remotely in general, but there for sure has not been conversations about onboarding as a VP during COVID. Not that I've been, been privy to. What, what's that been, been like? You know, I think the company did a really great job as best as they could. I mean, traditionally speaking, I would have gone to the headquarters and um, which is in New York City and I live in Dallas. And so I would have gone there for a couple of weeks and got to meet my colleagues and um, interact with everybody. But it just couldn't happen, obviously. The office was completely shut down. And so um, we did lots of Zoom meetings, lots of Zoom trainings. Um, and did kind of everything online and it's been fine. I think, I think part of it is that I've been so used to being a remote employee for the last, gosh, 12 years, I've been a remote employee. So for me mentally, it was okay and it was easy for me to do, but I imagine that there's other people who are kind of onboarding and it's really difficult, but there's a lot of tools that are available today to make that easier for employees. Um, but I'm still a fan of the face-to-face, -face, but 
I'm old school like that. So how, how have you, um, how have you integrated with your peer group, the executive team? What are some tips or strategies that have made that, that transition go smoothly? And then what about the sales team working under you? What are you doing to kind of make sure that, um, they've welcomed you with open arms and, and you're collaborating, you know, successfully. You know, I wish I had some magic bullet. There, there really isn't anything other than just great communication. Um, we're really active on Slack. We email each other. We text and call each other. But other than just planning and connecting um, and having, I think, spending time on discussing personal things too, like getting to know each other as humans like you would in an office standing by the water cooler versus just kind of talking about business all the time. I think that's really important. Um, but but yeah, there, there really isn't any magic bullet. It's just making an effort to stay connected and be available um, and caring about each other. And, what, and that's, that's going to build those relationships. What is, what is like the cadence of that though, like real specifically? So I heard you say, um, well, there's no magic bullet. It's just like communicating properly and staying in touch. Mm -hmm. but I'm wondering, it, does that mean every day for an hour? Does that mean once or twice a week for 15 minutes? What does that look like specifically? Um, I think everybody needs different things. And so it depends on like everybody that's on my team is very senior. Uh, everybody's very experienced. And so we tend actually not to interact as much as we probably should with each other. And we're all super, very, uh, very independent in terms of the, the work that we do. So other than being there to support each other, just quick check-ins, how are things going? I'm a big fan of having, you know, a weekly cadence meeting um, with individuals. Uh, and then at least a team meeting once a week so everybody can connect and, and talk about what's going on. How big is the team you're managing? Because I think that adds some context to this too. Sure. So um, the team that I work with today, uh, we're all really individual contributors and supporting each other. Um, so in the past, I've managed as many as seven, um, seven reps. Um, and then I've been an individual contributor for many times uh, for, for many jobs as well. I, I like kind of the player coach role. I think there's nothing like getting involved in getting um, involved in the deal cycle with a customer because it really kind of shows you what's going on uh, in the in that particular deal or in the industry or maybe some flaws within your products or anything that the executive leadership needs to uh, pay attention to. So I'm always a big fan of that player coach role, which I know is pretty controversial because a lot of people say, well, you can't do both well, which is true. Um, but but I do I do enjoy uh, working deals individually, too. I want to, we'll dive into that in a second, but I, do, I want to come back to one thing. You, you said yeah. there are some tools out there that are, that are helping build those relationships through, you know, the, the work from home model, mm -hmm. anything that you've really liked, or, or you can even say something you didn't like, because I know people are always looking to improve. Um, to improve collaboration and communication. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Slack, but I, but I think that any kind of, um, you know, communication tool like Slack would work. I've used Gmail before, I've used Skype before. I mean, I just think that uh, Slack provides a, a great way to be able to archive conversations, to store documents, that sort of thing, and to go back and search for conversations. Um, so I'm a big fan of that. Um, and, and in terms of collaboration, we use Zoom, but Again, there's plenty of um, collaboration tools that are available for video conferencing. I don't necessarily, I kind of don't like Teams, but that's really just my personal preference. I prefer Zoom or Blue Jeans. Uh, those are my two favorite. Um, those are really it. Those are the really only internal collaboration tools that we use. Okay, so I've held my breath for like 60 seconds here about this player code uh -oh. model. Okay. okay. I'm one of those people that I'd say 90% of the time believes the player coach model is flawed and, and, and won't work <clears throat> and you won't really excel at either. Now caveat may be, and you alluded to this before, your team is super senior. You said around you. And so you're not interacting all that much. Maybe they don't need as much coaching or training or development, <clears throat> but why do you think that that's an optimal and successful kind of um, structure when so many other folks like me, for example, um, stay away from that model as much as humanly possible? 
Okay, great question. Um, and I've, I've been in a player coach role in a couple of positions that I've had. And I've also had a more traditional direct supervisor type of role. And then of course, I've been a direct contributor before as well. So I, I think that player coach roles work really well with small organizations. Um, I was vice president of a company called Voice Thread uh, for about five years and we were tiny. Like there was maybe three people who were selling. Um, and so, and I was doing the majority of the sales, especially the enterprise level sales. Um, and so that was, that's much easier situation to take care of is when you're just uh, managing your own pipeline and maybe one or two other people. I think in that case, uh, it, it works really, really well, especially if you're in a startup situation where really it's all hands on deck and everybody needs to be selling. Um, so that's one area that I think it works well. The other area I think it works well is when um, there's a significant amount of senior people on the team. Uh, at the Born Group, there's a lot of people. I mean, there's, re there's really nobody that's junior. Um, everybody is very experienced. When I say experienced, I mean like, you know, 15, 20 years of sales experience um, at, at a senior level and enterprise level, do, you know, doing significant, uh, you know, I think, you know, everybody's probably bringing in more than, than 2 million a year. So um, then when it doesn't work is when you have more junior reps, um, when you have people who only have a couple of years of sales experience and they need more coaching from a day-to-day -day standpoint. They need very specific coaching through a deal cycle. So you're going to do discovery today. What are the things you're going to do during discovery? After you do discovery, then what's going to happen, right? So when they really need that extra level of support or they need you as a sales manager to come in and piggyback on those deals with them or help them close some of those deals or kind of be the executive in the room uh, for that. Also depends on the industry. I've, I've traditionally been in software um, and specifically educational technology is how I spent the majority of my career. So that is one area uh, where I think that it's not good to have a player coach, but I think it really varies. It's a very traditional sales models, probably player coach is not the best role. What do you think the line is there where <clears throat> there's too many reps for somebody to be a, a player coach? Oh, that's good. Um, I think if I had any more than four direct reports, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. How much, so in your role of player coach, did you actually have your own individual compensation plan also for the deals you closed? Yeah. Cause I, I do wonder how often it's, it's a compensation issue, right? Because at some point, you often make more as your player than you do as the coach. Right. So yeah, that's definitely true. Advising the wrong behavior. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe. So. That's definitely true. I, it really, I think it depends on the, um, the environment that you're in, the level of the people that you're working with. Um, but yeah, my compensation was based on my own personal success uh, sales and then my team sales. Uh, so, so that was, you know, part of the motivational factor. I am a kind of weird in terms of a salesperson. I, I'm really not traditionally motivated by commission and money. Um, I know that sounds super weird to say, but I mean, of course I am motivated by money and I mean, I'm in sales to make money, but we're all here to work, right. And to make money. I'm really motivated by helping customers find a solution to whatever their problem is. And I really love helping, um, new salespeople, especially, um, female salespeople find success and find their way. I really enjoy that. And so, which is kind of why the player coach thing was always something that I was super attracted to was because I was able to kind of help mentor and guide uh, young people as they, or younger salespeople as they were going through the process. So Scott, how do you feel now based on, on her example <laughs> of not the player coach role, but that, that concept of if I've got an experienced sales team, I can do the player coach role. But if I've got a lot of junior reps, right? Like Scott, I'm thinking about to, to our, when we first met and started working together. Um, what, what do you she's, think about that? She's right. I mean, I, I said 90% of the time, the structure I don't think is going to work. And, and the, the scenario she described is exactly sort of the, the outlier. So um, I, can, I can agree with that and, and understand that. I think it's really interesting to, to try to figure out what the body count is in terms of where it breaks. You know, Amanda said four. I don't know if four is the, the right number or not, um, but it certainly breaks at a particular point in time. And, and not just the seniority level of the sales team, but also probably the size 
of the organization and what they're trying to do and what they're trying to accomplish. You know, if you're in like a, a, a high growth, um, you know, grow at all costs, VC kind of startup, I, I, I don't think that, you know, Amanda is necessarily going to be able to do what she's doing right now. She's in a totally different kind of, kind of company, uh, in my understanding, right? Yeah, so. you, you're absolutely right. I think in that case, you, you really have to put on, because then you're, you're working on operations and you're dealing with um, setting things up and, and, and getting the company going. And it's not just about getting those sales. So um, I, I, I agree with you there for sure, Scott. Yeah. It, it's definitely, there's a time and a place for that kind of role. And it's very rare. It's just personally, I've enjoyed those types of roles better. Yeah. I want to dig into what you said before about, um, you know, being motivated by coaching and mentoring other, you know, women who are either entering the field or already in the field. I mean, you belong to a class that is fairly small in numbers. You're a female VP of sales. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, do you feel a certain burden of responsibility to like make sure you do really, really well? like kind of carrying the torch and opening doors for other people? Is that something that you think about at all? N not really. Um, I don't. I, I, I do feel like it is my responsibility to reach out and help the women that I personally know, but like generally as a global thing, like do I have to lead women everywhere? No. Um, but women that I, that I know, women that I've worked with, um, I'm particularly fond of mentoring SDRs. I think that um, that's a, a oh. great uh it's 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 been really wonderful to me to be able to get to do some of that um as i've grown in my career especially as they've grown in their career to like watch them over the years um because i think a lot of times people start as an sdr because you're interested in moving up and and being an account executive and then kind of moving your way through uh the sales you know hierarchy and so when i when i get to see that and get to witness women who can do that especially when they have such high potential i really really latch on to them so, and so why yeah. not let me push you why not expand your purview and and the the number of people that you can influence i mean you talked about you know women that you know and and you know are close to maybe why not have a larger goal for yourself to have an impact on the global sales community in particular with giving women increased opportunities and increased opportunities to be in positions of, of power at the highest level. Very interesting that you should say that because we were talking about all these videos that I've been doing on LinkedIn and kind of building that brand. And since then, I've actually had women contact me and reach out and just say, you know, can we talk for 30 minutes? I want to get your ideas on this. And they're essentially complete strangers. I mean, they're LinkedIn connections. And so I have because of that. Um, but, but I haven't been proactively trying to go out there and do that. And it would be one of those things that would really fill a bucket. And I will definitely give that some more thought. I will, um, because because I do. It is important to me, and it is important to give back to the general community. I think maybe figuring out how to how to do that and the best way to do that, within you know the limited number of hours that I have in a given week. But but I can be very fulfilled by that. Yeah, I'm very familiar with the. Can I have thirty minutes of your time? <laughs> your right. Request. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I get that a lot, but that's. But in Amanda's case, in Amanda's case, like. Her, her request that, that we're talking about specifically, it feels like there's a lot of value there, right? It is, yeah. People, and I think maybe people are asking you different things that they're asking me is my guess. Um, but those conversations are really around I'm dealing with specific issues that women face in the workplace, specifically in sales, how to navigate some of those issues, yeah. um, how to change industry so they could be in one vertical and they want to move to another vertical. And I've done that. And how did you do that? And what was that process like? Um, uh, how how can I um, be a leader and still have a family? How can I travel with work and have kids and do all these things that I need to do that traditionally men don't um, have to think about as much? It, it just comes a little bit uh, harder for them. Are you, I'd like to dig into that because that's something we try to explore and, and encourage. What are the, you know, I think we know, but I also want to hear the advice. What are the questions women are bringing to you? And what kind of advice are you able to give um, based on your own experiences? 
You know, I think the biggest thing that, that I hear from women is the lack of confidence in their ability to do something. So they'll say things like, well, I've only been an SDR or I've only done this, or, um, you know, somebody's never going to think about me for this or low. It's not low self-esteem because these are very intelligent, strong women, but I think women, I mean, I'm sure you've seen the statistics that if there's like a job description and you don't meet every single one of those items, uh, a woman is probably not going to apply for that job. Whereas men, if they meet maybe half of those requirements, they're going to apply for the job. And so I always tell women to, um, first of all, always ask for what you want, because if you're not asking for what you want, you're never going to get it. Uh, so that's a huge, huge piece of advice that I always give to women, uh, really with anything in their lives, but specifically at work. And then if you aren't applying for some of those jobs, uh, I, I always tell them like those jobs, it's, it's a unicorn that most companies are looking for, right? It's a general framework of what they're looking for. But if you're not putting your name in the hat, then you're never going to get selected for an interview. Uh, whereas I think men tend to just be overly confident and throwing their names in the hats for things that they're not qualified for, uh, but they end up getting the job anyway. So uh, I do encourage women to um, push themselves out of their boxes so that we've built for ourselves. So let's say you, let's say you, um, you give someone that feedback and you can still sense that they're like, well, yeah, I know that's, I know that's true, Amanda, you know, but their own, you know, there's something in their own way right? How do you get people to try to go past that point, right? You know, have you, have you figured that out a little bit? Especially if it's not self-confidence, which you kind right. of rejected as, a, as the answer. So if it's not self-confidence. Um, so I can tell you a story that, it, that this happened is um, I had a friend who reached out to me um, about six weeks ago and she introduced me to another friend of hers and put us together and said, hey, Amanda um, might be able to help you uh, with your job search process and my friend had gotten laid off. And so we just talked on the phone and I was just chatting with her and getting to know her. And, you know, she was kind of really down in the dumps about her layoff and trying to figure out a way to get a, a job. And she was really nervous about the fact that she was unemployed. And so I told her my trick about doing this video talking about that you're looking for a position and what your skill set is and all that sort of thing. And she was really hesitant to do it because, you know, putting yourself out there like that is not easy. And so uh, I said, you know, send me the first video that you do and I'll give you some feedback on it. So she sent me the video and then she's like I'm gonna send another video with my hair in a different way and so then she put her hair back and she did the video this way and I was like girl it has nothing to do with your hair right and so but those are the kinds of things that women think about and so kind of coaching her through that process and getting her to realize that that it she just needed to do it like just be brave and will you uh maybe get embarrassed or feel weird or maybe some people are going to think ugly things about you, maybe, but who cares? Like life is too short to worry about what other people think. And I think women in general often are worried about how they look and how they sound, uh, what other people are gonna think about them when they do. And I, I try to help them get over that by taking kind of the baby steps that they need to take. So she sent me a, a video, I gave her some feedback on it, make it shorter, right? She sent me another video, I'm like, that's it. Okay, now we're gonna close caption the video. And so I taught her how to do closed captioning uh, for her video. And so it took steps. So essentially to answer your question, I just kind of pushed her um, every step of the way instead of just giving her advice and letting her go I, I was kind of her her um, her partner and pushing her her accountability partner and pushing her to what she said she wanted to do, but she hadn't done it yet. Yeah, that's great. Just you know, because for other people, you know, I have one. But what do you like to use for the closed captioning? Um, Capwing. Okay. Capwing, Capwing.com. It's free and it's so easy. It it's automatically does it for you. I call it auto magical. Um, you just click the button and it automatically captions your video and it does make some mistakes, uh, but you can easily edit it out and then republish it. It's super easy. Cool. How often are you doing videos? I'm trying to do them once a week now. Okay. Um, that's my goal, I, but I'm not going to do them unless I have something great to say. I think sometimes people get stuck in this, like I have to post so many times a month or so many times a week in order to stay relevant. And I'm just like, I'll post when I have something great to share, but if I'm just posting to post, then it's, 
doesn't come across as you're not a, you're not a fan you're not a fan of the people who say you have to post every single day well i mean if you've got something great to say every single day scott and you do does anybody have anything great it. to say 365 days a year really I mean, we all have our bad days so um you know I sure, I, I sure as hell don't post every single day yeah it's um i i say post things that are relevant and on your mind um but I found myself like driving in the car and I'll think of something I should post about and I'll like jot it down really quick. Um, and then I'll do a post on that maybe the next week after I've had time to formulate my thoughts. Um, and sometimes my posts are really short, uh, like 60 seconds. And sometimes they're like three minutes long if, if it's like a longer story, but I try to keep them less than 90 seconds. We got to wrap up here pretty soon. I want to get into what is working for you right now to bring in these large deals. You know, you're, you're bringing home, I think you said most of the reps in your team have like a $2 million plus um, quota or goal for the, the end of the year. So I'm making an assumption here that these deal, the deal sizes are a little larger, <clears throat> a little less frequent. What is working to reel these in right now for you and your team? And, and, and what advice would you have to folks out there listening? You know, tips, tactics, tricks, Anything like that that's working really hard, for you, that's working really well for you right now? Uh, well, I think if, it, if everything was going so great, I wouldn't be, um, you know, doing anything except for reeling them all in. So I, I like every industry, you know, we're all struggling. Um, I think what the people on my team have had the most success with um, are the people who've been around for a little bit longer, who have a deeper pipeline. Um, and they might have had things fall off in... March, April, May, June, but those customers are starting to come back. So I think it's, if you build a good relationship with your prospects at the initial stages and they genuinely know that you care about them and you are there to help solve a problem for them, then they're going to come back. If you come across as like, are you going to close this deal next week? Or I, I have an end of the month cadence and I, I have to get this done then you kind of sound like a sleazy salesperson and nobody wants to do business with that. So I think the people on my team that have done really, really well um, are the more senior people on the team who've been at the company for longer. They've got a deeper pipeline. You always have to be adding to that pipeline um, because if you don't, then you run out and there's nothing going on. So I think good pipeline management is the key to that, establishing good relationships um, and making sure that you just, um, stay in contact with some of those those potential customers in a non salesy way what is that what is that pipeline to to attainment ratio number for you um i'm, I'm a fan of three to one that's my preference i don't always get that in fact it's been very rare in the last few years that i've been able to have a pipeline that was that that deep that was able to do that. So you just got to really make sure that you're working extra hard to convert the deals that, that you do have. So does that mean you do a stronger job of qualifying earlier? Um, you know, that's a good question. Does that mean I do a better job of qualifying? I'd like to think so. <laughs> I'd like to think that we do a better job. I know that you would hit it, right? Like is that you better, have, what's in there better be good, right? Better be good, yeah. If you're going to have a smaller pipeline, yeah, you definitely are, are going to need to be able to identify. Also, you have to cut your losses early. Like if you know that somebody is not interested in or they don't have the budget or all those red flags that you see in the sales cycle, if you know that those people aren't going to be moving forward, really like cut your losses and move on. I think so many times younger salespeople in particular, and I fell victim to this on occasion too. I'm like a little Pollyanna that I think, oh, they're going to buy. They really want my stuff. And then they don't. And you spend all this time and all this energy circling back and having another follow-up meeting or bringing other people in that shouldn't be in and you just kind of wasted everybody's time if you just read the handwriting on the wall pretty early on then you should identify where to spend your time because that's the most valuable resource that you have in sales is your time yeah i love it so um before we ask you our last question, just a, again, a quick shout out to Lead 411, Find Them, Gong, and Perception Predict, our sponsors. Um, where can we help you? How can we help Amanda uh, get things done? You know, I don't think it's really about getting things done for me and how you can help. I think what I would like to see just salespeople in general do, and I've mentioned this several different times, is, is really focus on the human that you're selling to. 
And so many times we get a bad name as salespeople. Um, and, and I'm sure you've attended, you know, conferences and, and people will put like, what do you think of salespeople up on the wall? And you put all these like negative things like slimy and, and um, sleazy and all these things to describe salespeople. And I remember seeing that for the first time and I was like, I am nothing like that. Like, I am not slimy. I'm not sleazy. I really genuinely want to um, make your life better with the solution that I have um, or, or drive profits for you, whatever it is that my solution can solve. And to be thought of in that negative way, it's still shocking to me that people think that way about salespeople because I don't associate myself that way. So if you are one of those sleazy salespeople, stop it. Stop yeah. it. Please do that. Stop. You, you make us all look bad when you do something shitty like that. The other thing I'm going to tell people is on LinkedIn, stop sending sales pitches via DMs the instant that you connect with somebody. That is totally against the rules. Yep. But yeah, well, other than that, you know, just be kind I, to one another. I, I agree with you because I, I still find it hard <laughs> that people don't believe that my mother says I'm a wonderful person to know, right? Mm -hmm. So, I know. And I know Scott's mom very well, and she feels the same way. Like, how could someone not love Scott? No. Um, but I've got, I actually have one more question. Uh, okay. Your LinkedIn profile, and I want you to define it because I really actually like it, right? You are a self defined okay. goal digger, G O A L, so we don't mess this up. Yeah. What does that mean for you? Because I think it's super important. Good question. So I'll tell you where that came from. First of all, I didn't come up with it. It was a t-shirt that I saw from a cycling studio. So I'm a triathlete and a cyclist and I saw a, um, like a t-shirt that just said gold digger. And it was like a picture of a bike with, with the gear in there. And I just thought, oh, that's awesome because you're cycling for a goal, right? Well, I think automatically when I hear the word goal, I think about sales. And so I said, I wanted that, uh, that t-shirt. So I proudly wore it around and, uh, for cycling and for sales. I, I think that it's about like focusing on not just your metrics and the numbers that you need to hit as an employee for wherever you're working, but thinking about your own personal goals and what you want in life and what you're striving for, people that you're helping, people that you're working with, um, people in your family, like what are your goals? Uh, identify what those goals are and work every day to taking a step to achieve those goals. It doesn't have to be something big and major that you do every day, but you're constantly digging for that goal um, to make it happen. You know, you, you got a shovel and you got to use the shovel. A lot of us don't have an excavator and we can go in and scoop out and get right to our goals, but you got to dig every day to get to the goals that you've set for yourself. What kind of life goals do you have? What kind of life goals do you encourage people to have? Oh, life goals. Um, so I have, I'm a mother of two teenage daughters. And so it's really important to me to um, raise them well and raise them to be independent, young, smart women who um, are going to venture off soon, hopefully. So they'll get out of my hair and go off to school or go do, go live their lives somewhere. So that's a life goal for me. Um, I have a life goal of retiring early. And so uh, my goal is to retire when I'm 50. And I started saving for retirement when I was 22 years old. And that is a huge piece of advice that I would give anybody, uh, especially the youngest people who might be listening is you have to save for retirement. You have to, um, even if it's just 2% of your paycheck every month, you got to do it. Um, and so I have a huge um, goal to do some traveling um, and then, you know, make people around me successful and happy and give back as much as I can. Richard. Yeah. How old, are, how old are you again, Richard? Are you, are you retired yet? Are you retired? <laughs> now, let me just say that when I retire, I'm not going to stop working. Like yeah. when I say retire, I just mean like retire from corporate world, right? But I'll still do that's stuff. very That's very different though. Okay. Yeah. Is, I'm is, not going to be sitting on the beach drinking margaritas, although maybe I'll bartend at a beach and I'll just be making people margaritas. Hey, if that's the case, Richard, we're already retired. You've been retired for uh, eight years now. That yeah. is, I think Scott, what we need to do is to her point about getting her daughters out of the house is we could do that faster and just put Braden and Caleb and Riley and Bodie, you know, they're, they're between 12 and 10 each that we should just buy them an apartment and let them go live by themselves. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. order the fly stallion. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Right that, that won't hurt. <laughs> anyway, Amanda, thank you so much for, for joining us. It's yeah. been a fascinating conversation and we covered a lot. So I'm, I really appreciate it. So Thank you again, and, and we look forward to seeing your videos on LinkedIn. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next um, surfing conference, so I, I want to I go surf with you, Scott. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. 
So yeah, now, she, Amanda's going to swim circles around me in the ocean now that she just said she's a triathlete. Athlete. I was no, thinking but, the same thing. I was like, oh my gosh. So. No, I'm, I'm not that great at surfing though. So okay. I, I have a very specific way that I like to surf and it's with an instructor who will like push me because oh, it's yeah. a paddling thing. I'm 5'2", and I'm, so I'm really short, that's, so it's really hard for me to That's how it works. Yeah. We got you. We got you. <laughs> Give me a push, and I can get up any day. I can, I can stand up there all day long, sir, yeah. but it's hard, to, it's hard to catch. All right. Thanks, Amanda. We appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.